China at the moment has the second biggest community, IR community, after the United States. And in the past 10 years, we've seen quite a lot of developments in Chinese international relations theories. So on your left at the bottom, for example, you see Tang Shiping, who has a PhD in biology and now works in international relations. And what he did was he applied the theory of social evolution to international relations in order to demonstrate how concepts evolve. Uh, in the top left corner, you see uh, Liu Feng, who is trying to resolve internal debates within realism. In the middle, you see the two theorists that I will talk about mainly in this lecture. So at the bottom, you have Qin Yaqing, and on top, you have Yan Xuetong. So these theorists uh, are, are people that you're going to hear about a lot in this lecture. And on the right, you have uh, Zhao Tingyang, who is a philosopher, a Beijing-based philosopher, who is trying to apply the Chinese idea of all under heaven, of Tianxia, to the international system. Now, all of these are different theoretical texts, and all of these are clearly existing non-Western international relations theories. So, how were these theories produced and in what context did they emerge? If we look at the development of international relations in China, it is broadly accepted that it happened mainly after the reform and opening period. So it started after 1979 mainly. Because before that theory was essentially related to policy. And it was hard to separate theory and policy. So really the independent development of theory started allegedly after 1979. Now there are two trends that mix together in that period. The first one is that a lot of translations of foreign texts, so a lot of translations of these white western men that I showed you, started appearing in Chinese. So firstly, in 1985, 1987, uh, Chun Lemin, a scholar uh, in international relations uh, from China, introduced a lot of Western concepts to the Chinese audience. And after that, in the 90s, we saw Kenneth Waltz, theory of international politics translated. We saw Robert Gilpin, etc. So we saw all of these texts being translated. This is the first trend. The second trend is that we're not really sure yet if policy is completely separate from theory building in China. So if you look at the 1980s, a lot of foreign policy scholars were really concerned with the question, should China be a revisionist state? Should it be a revolutionary state? Or should it essentially uh, comply with the, the pattern of development of uh, opening towards the international system as it is? In the 90s, a lot of debates were centered around the question, uh, what should China's national interests be? In the noughties, we have the question, should China be a status quo power, or should it reform the international system in order to become a great power? Now, all of these questions have to do with China, Chinese identity, Chinese interests. So on one hand, we have these translated texts from foreign theorists that show you how theory building essentially happened so far. On the other, you have all of these concerns with national identity and national interests. So what they blended into during the late 90s was essentially a debate centered around the question, should there be Chinese IR theory? Because on one hand, we have the concern with national identity and basically academic identity. On the other, we have foreign IR theory in a Chinese context. Now, as the debate stands at the moment, we have two prominent scholars at each end. Yan Xuetong and Qin Yaqing, both of whom share uh, quite a great number of similarities between each other. So both of them had their PhDs from the States, both of them publish in both English and Chinese and try to speak to international debates. Uh, both of them have been based in mainland China for the majority of their academic careers. So there, are a certain number, there is a certain number of similarities between these two scholars. And this is why I'm focusing on them today. They represent different sides of the debate and they share a great number of similarities. Now, if we look at their positioning and their theories, we get to the following table here. Now on the left, we have a brief summary of Yan Xuetong's ideas. He tells you that it is not necessary to have a Chinese school of art theory. He tells you that social science is universal and he tells you that what applies to the state of China might apply to other states and vice versa. So there is no need to have schools separated on the basis of nationality. 
he tells you schools in social sciences are, are called basically names which are, are, are centered around their main arguments. So liberalism is not called Americanism or Europeanism, it's called liberalism. Realism, again, is not called by the name of the country, it is simply called by the name of the argument, because realists are the people who see the glass as half empty, and they're people who see, allegedly, the real world as it is. So, Yan Xiaotong tells you that there is no need for a Chinese school of art theory. On the other end, we have Qin Yaqing, who tells you that there is always intersubjectivity, meaning the way that one scholars from one region or one scholar sees things is not the, the way that others see things. And this is why we should have different theories for different regions. Uh, and he essentially tells you that the current state of variant theory is Western. Uh, he tells you that IR is essentially an American social science and that Chinese theories are needed. Now, interestingly, both of these scholars rely on ancient Chinese texts for, internet, for intellectual inspiration. So Yan Xiaotong is looking at pre-Qin thought. He's looking at the Warring States period. He's looking at the period essentially before Christ, at a period that's BC. And he's looking especially at the Xunzi, but also at the, the Kongzi, the Guanzi, the Hanfeizi, and all of the, the texts that come from that period. But he focuses especially on the Xunzi. And he also focuses on the stratagems, which is essentially a text on certain ways to wage war and to behave strategically. An ancient Chinese text on that. Now, Qin Yaqing is focusing on Zhongyong dialectics from Confucianism. Now, Zhongyong dialectics is a concept which we'll talk about more later, but it essentially, uh, it, it's an idea, it's a dialectical idea that tells you that both extremes exist at the same time, and still you should always aim for the middle. So we'll talk about that idea in depth later. He also looks at Chinese sociologist Fei Xiaotong and looks at the Asian performativity system. So historically in Asia, we had a tributary system where China was essentially the center of Asia and other states would pay tributes to China. Now later, of course, that changed and currently this is not the state of the Asian uh, international system. So. The, both of them look for inspiration from ancient thought, but in different ways. Now, in Yan Xiaotong, we have the following core concepts. For him, the solution to world problems and the solution to finding order in a disordered system is essentially hierarchy. He tells you, if you and me, or one state and another state are equal, and both of them, there is no set of rules for them, that telling them which one is the leading one and which one is the one that follows, essentially we're gonna clash because both of us are gonna try and get the same thing, get the same type of power or conquer the same type of area, get the same type of resources. So he tells you hierarchy is the solution to this. Now, in this theory, he essentially assigns managerial roles to great powers. So great powers, he tells you, should essentially manage the international society. And he also focuses on the idea of moral authority. So he tells you that authority is really sustainable at best through a moral type of rule. So he tells you that a ruler that's not moral and that's not just is not going to be a ruler for too long. Now, Qin Yaqing has rather different ideas. He focuses on relationality. He tells you that relationality is key, that relationality has meaning. With that relationality, he tells you there would be no world. Because all we know about the world is how we're related to each other. All that states know about the world is how they're related to each other. If there is only one state which exists outside of other states, then there is really no system, there are really no problems. If there's no relationality, there is no world. So he tells you that relationality is core, relationality is key. He also focuses on processes. He tells you that we should look at processes of themselves and by themselves. And he also, interestingly, assigns a multiplicity of identities to each state. He tells you that each state can have more than one, than one identity. Now, the task of this next section of the talk is essentially to evaluate whether Qin and Yan uh, achieve their goals, the goals that they set for themselves. 
So here I'm really, I'm using hermeneutics, which is methodology that takes the texts as they are. I'm not ascribing external meanings to the text. I'm looking at what they claim to do, and I'm assessing whether they achieve their own goals. So first, I take their self-ascribed claims and their criteria. Then I evaluate to what extent they're innovative. The reason I evaluate their innovativeness is because they claim they're innovative in perspective with existing theories. And finally, I conclude that neither presents new concepts and then move on to the next section which re-engages re them with debates in international relations.